Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Prokopis Dukas, and I'm a journalist. I have the pleasure of moderating this next panel, the eighth, about the formation of the new Greek state, territorial, political, economic, and social aspects. Mrs. Kalliopia Migdalu, here on my right, is a senior research fellow in Elia Mep. She's an architect, and her topic will be the integration of the refugees in, in, in Greece after 1923. Mr. Yakovos Mikhailidis, who is a professor of modern and contemporary history in the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, will uh, speak with a video, unfortunately, he couldn't make it, uh, about the same topic, the integration of refugees. And Mr. Dimitris Sotiropoulos, on my left, is a professor of contemporary political history in the University of Peloponnese. He will speak about the general political uh, the evolution of the Greek state after the Lausanne Treaty and the Asia Minor disaster. So, um, Ms. Amigdalu, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for being here. Um, this presentation concerns the spatial footprint uh, of this massive and mutual displacement of populations across the border. For reasons of lack of time, I'm going to focus on the Greek side. And um, as you can understand, the inflow of more than 1.2 million refugees and exchangees into the Greek kingdom transformed the urban and rural landscape while presenting a huge challenge for the state. Northern Greece, especially Macedonia and Thrace, received a large part of the refugee population. In the 1928 census, for example, almost 50% of Thessaloniki uh, were refugees, while in, in Drama, 70% of the population were refugees. Meanwhile, in the countryside, hundreds of Muslim-inhabited villages were now settled by Greek refugees, and hundreds of new villages were founded from zero. So at the most basic level, like in Turkey, resettlement was divided into urban and rural. And indeed, around half of the incoming refugees were channeled uh, uh, towards the countryside in what was considered to be a beneficial solution for both state and refugees. The refugees would have easier means of survival by engaging with agriculture. They were given seeds and animals and, um, and land, um, apart from housing. Uh, at the same time, they would mobilize and expand the farming sector. It is also important to realize that the rural resettlement process was combined with major infrastructural works, such as the draining of swamps, the construction of dams, and the diversion of rivers, especially along the Axios and Strimonas rivers. Together, these works produced over 82,000 hectares and 820,000 donum or stremata of land. Um, and here you can see the works along uh, Srimonas. The other half of the refugee population, around 600,000, were settled in cities, and most of those, around 360,000, settled in three large urban centers, Athens, Piraeus, and Thessaloniki. You can understand that whole new neighborhoods were created in the urban fringes. Here you can see the example of Kesariani. Uh, 1924, there are still the tents in the foreground, um, and uh, towards the back, you can see mud brick housing and wooden uh, housing. I'm going to talk uh, about this in more detail in a second. Today, you, you wouldn't recognize this area. It's full of apartment buildings. Um, and uh, so cities expanded under conditions of emergency in all directions, sometimes doubling in size. The settlement process lasted for decades. Now, whether rural or urban, one cate can categorize this huge spatial transformation along four main types of settlement. One, as you already know, um, housing and exchange property. So the ho homes of Muslims, of Turks that were left behind were now taken over by Greeks. Second, housing produced by the state. So new housing, wooden, mud brick, uh, stone, concrete. We will talk about this in a second. 
Third, this is not very well known, but self-help housing, encouraged and supported by the state, especially after 1930. And of course, four slums, self-made uh, shacks by the refugees themselves. In the research project Home Across that I supervise, we are digitally mapping this spatial footprint in Attica and Izmir provinces. Uh, here you can see a work in progress mapping of the refugee settlements uh, created in Athens and Piraeus. At the first glance, you will notice that the refugee settlements form a ring around the historical centers of uh, Athens and Piraeus, whether at a distance from the city centers or touching uh, the, the fringes of the city. Um, the research has shown that in some cases the refugee settlements followed um, sources of labor. So where, where there was already industry, there, was, there were refugee settlements um, close by. Whereas in other cases, the industry followed the refugees. So we have examples like in Nea Philadelphia and in Nea Coquinha where refugees are settled and then the industry uh, invests there in order to be close to cheap labor. Um, and named after the cities in true, Germany. True, true. Uh, yes, um, and um, in some occasions, these neighborhoods, so the, the main criterion for um, settling on land is um, whether how available it is and whether it's empty or not. And in some cases, they, these neighborhoods pop up in public or institutional land, which makes it easier to expropriate but we have many occasions where a refugee settle on private land and there are decades long uh, disputes among the state and the old landowners in order to expropriate this for the refugees. Now in the area we study in Athens and Piraeus that I showed before, as you understand, there are only three of the four mechanisms I mentioned. So we don't have any uh, ex-Muslim properties. Um, we have state-made housing, self-help housing and slums. Um, I will start by showing you some examples of state-made housing. In the beginning, this was completely, um, you know, uh, primitive. So we have uh, wooden housing and mud brick housing, like here. Um, this, as the state was trying to house as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. If we look um, at the structure of this urban block here, you will see that, let me see. Sorry, I, you cannot, um, I cannot, um, I don't have a pointer. Uh, you can see that the, the structures are in, on the perimeter of the urban block and they form a communal courtyard in the middle. Each structure of the eight, like there are eight um, rectangle structures there, has eight rooms. So every little square you can see on the, on the plan housed one family or perhaps in some cases, one family would take two rooms. Every little square is only 20 square meters. Uh, of course, there were no other infrastructure provisions, no sewage or water, and the uh, two rectangles you can see in the middle are the communal toilets. Um, of, and the refugees gradually uh, expanded by taking over the um, pavements or by expanding towards the interior of the courtyard in order to, to make these spaces livable. There, there's no time to expand on this, but it's very interesting how they, the refugees managed to create homes out of these uh, minimal spaces. Um, in, the late, in the second half of the 20s and the early 30s, uh, better housing is constructed, this time out of stone. Uh, this is an example from Nea Coquinha. Um, and the, and this is from Kesariani. There's a huge variety which we are trying to record and to, or to categorize. And um, after 1929, floor ownership, kat um, mulkieti or orizodia idioktesia, became possible, meaning that inhabitants could be owners of their own apartments. And this paved the way for multi-floor mass housing. Here you can see probably the most famous mass housing complex in Greece, uh, Alexandras, uh, the refugee housing on Alexandras Avenue, which has been spared demolition after lots of struggle from civil society and academics, but is still uh, unrestored. Uh, for those that are interested, uh, on, on the lower part, of, you can see Alexandras Avenue and Panathinaikos Stadium, 
And what is less known is that behind Panathinaikos Stadium, uh, we have more um, housing, housing. It's wooden housing, Kudriotika, and, uh, and slums at the same time uh, on the lower part. Um, now, a very important modern architects were involved in the design of this mass housing units, and this brings the refugee settlement process uh, in discussion in, in connection with the history of the modern movement and what's taking what's happening worldwide all over Europe with the Bauhaus, new ideas about uh, living, about functionalism, about zoning can be uh, are reflected in these projects. Now uh, this is another um, post-war mass housing uh, in Kesariani. And apart from state-made uh, housing, as I said before, uh, another mechanism that was employed after 1930 because uh, of a new legislation introduced by the state is self-help housing. So refugees still in lack of decent home organized into building associations and petitioned for pieces of land for self-help housing in order to build their own homes. Here you can see, for example, that um, this um, part has been divided into plots and is given, is, is, uh, um, it, it is allowed to, for the building association to construct homes there, either on their own or through contractors. Mm, now, and, and here are some other examples of post-war self-help housing. What is interesting is that through this mechanism, the housing that is produced is not distinctively refugee-like. There is nothing, um, you know, uh, morphologically, architecturally, that, that separates these houses from what's happening in the rest of the city, in contrast to the mass housing units that you saw before. Of course, these state efforts were not enough. They were never enough. Uh, in 1960, 10,000 families still lived in slums. State-made housing and self-help housing continued in the post-war era uh, all the way into the 70s. Um, and I have to say here that the refugees were charged for the housing that they were given. This was not for free. Um, they, were, uh, they owed the state installments uh, for receiving this uh, housing, and this caused a lot of friction between the refugees and the state. Um, this is a beautiful diagram that we found in the archive. Um, I'm sorry that you cannot see it from very close, uh, but very close. It is Asirmatos in Petralona. You, some of you might have seen the movie Sinikia to Oniro. It's a beautiful movie that shows exactly uh, this space. Um, and you can see how the slum uh, is, you know, is half uh, made on the, on Filopapu, on the rock. Um, the, this is a, a diagram made by the state, the ministry, so... Uh, so yes. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Um, and um, it, it's half, on the half below the um, Periferia Coast, the ring road of Filopapu, and half on the rock. Um, and in this map, in this diagram, you can already see the organized housing at the top which will replace the slum. And what you cannot see here is a huge building by El Vasilikioti, which I will show you in the next uh, slide. It's this one here. You can, uh, it's a beautiful mass housing unit uh, on the peripheral road of uh, Filopapu. Uh, and on the upper um, photograph, you can see the two floor stone housing that was constructed in the 50s to replace uh, these slums. So, uh, to conclude, and this is uh, one last drawing from our project where we are recording house by house what has survived today. In the last two or three decades, part of the surviving refugee housing has transformed into a valued repository of collective memory and bearer of multiple histories and meanings. People have started being interested in the refugee housing that survived. Architects, academics, and refugee associations see in these structures, see these structures as material testimonies of refugee history, as monuments of modern Greek history, as important products of architectural modernism, uh, and as such, they reflect uh, the discussions taking place in national and international spheres. 
last but not least, these um, surviving buildings can be understood as a tangible reminder of the importance of the welfare state, especially now as we witness its weakness in face of never-ending crisis. So by mapping this genealogy of the city, the making of the urban fringes, we aim to contribute to a better understanding not only of the cities that we live in, but also to bring into the discussion these important aspects of modern Greek history that range from memory and heritage to the politics of social welfare. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Samuel. Excuse my interruptions. I have the tendency to talk all the time. Uh, there is a huge uh, discussion, even now, in Greece, what to do with these buildings in Alexandras Avenue. Some claim that they should be kept and uh, restored, or there's another proposition, if I'm not wrong, that says some of them should be demolished, demolished and some of them be, should be kept as a... As mm. a uh, monument of, of uh, as a memory to all this. This the housing uh, situation. Well, the the after the the disaster in Asia Minor, the housing the planning was was a shock, if I'm not wrong, for the whole of Greece. Uh, and I want to discuss this afterwards with Mr. Sotiropoulos, the, the general shock mm. that the society had. But if you uh, uh, if you'd like to have uh, uh, to pose any questions to Mrs. Samidalo now, you may, if you like, or we can do a discussion later, whatever, whatever you like. Okay. So, if there are no questions now, uh, let us please listen to what Mr. Yakovos Mikhailidis has to say. He's a professor of modern and contemporary history in the Good morning, Thessaloniki everybody. University. I would like to thank both the academic and the organizing committee for the invitation to join you this afternoon uh, in this fruitful conference. Uh, in my contribution, I will focus on uh, the issue of uh, the refugee settlement in Greek Macedonia after uh, the Treaty of Lausanne and its consequences both uh, to the Greek state and, of course, to the area. The exchange of Greek and Turkish populations based on the Treaty of Lausanne caused significant changes in both countries. According to the official Greek census in 1928, the total number of refugees settled in Greece during the period of 1912-1923 amounted to 1,221,000 thousand individuals, which accounted approximately to 20% of the total Greek population. Out of these refugees, a total of 638,000 refugees, uh, accounting more, something more than 52% of the total refugee population, settled in Greek Macedonia. With the arrival of the refugees, the population of Greek Macedonia reached uh, approximately 1,400,000 people. This means that the refugees represented 45% of the total population of Greek Macedonia in 1928. For Greek Macedonia, a total number of uh, 329,000 Muslims and approximately 66,000 Slavophones left because the Treaty of Nihi, considering themselves as Bulgarians. The radical change in the ethnic mosaic of Greek Macedonia during the period before the Balkan Wars and after the population exchange is depicted in that table. The establishment of the new ethnogeographical picture of Greek Macedonia during the Indo-European period was just one aspect of the consequences of the refugee issue. A series of radical changes can be identified at various other levels. The most significant changes are related to the agricultural settlement of the refugees and the chain reactions this caused in the economic social and political fields. 
The descriptions provided by the members of foreign humanitarian missions who visited Greek Macedonia after 1922 to assist the Greek government reveal the region's backwardness on all levels. The words, for example, of the head of the American Red Cross who visited Greek Macedonia are indicative. Quote, the situation of uh, the refugees is shocking, especially regarding women and children who constitute a large part of the refugee population. Many of the children were dressed with torn rags and often had no shoes. They had endured and continue to endure extreme deprivation and their health is often in a desperate condition. Many are sick and have open wounds on their bodies. It was evident that, along with the provision of food and clothing, there was a larger need for medical care for the refugees." End of quote. In other reports, Americans compared the situation in the refugee camps to war camps, estimating the deaths occurred on a daily basis, reaching more than 50. Clearly, these observations on the field led the Americans to establish hospitals and orphanages in different places in Greek Macedonia. This situation unfolded for about a year, until the end of 1923, when humanitarian organizations believed they have completed most of their work and then they withdrew. They thus paved the way for the second phase of refugee settlement, which aimed not only at relieving the refugees, but also at their productive integration into the Greek society. This period, which began in 1924, is directly linked to the actions of the Refugee Settlement Commission, which was established at the initiative of the League of Nations. What is worth mentioning, and largely unknown, is the fact that the Refugee Settlement Commission adopted the programs that American philanthropic organizations, particularly, of course, the Near East Relief, had already developed for the Macedonia region, which they designed to transform Greek Macedonia into a model laboratory for the settlement of refugee populations, where refugees would be the exclusive owners of small, cultivable plots of land. The central core of the American perspective was that the agricultural settlement of refugees, in order to be sustainable, should be based on providing loans to farmers rather than distributing money to them in the form of uh, allowances in an effort to make the program self-sustainable. In this way, the Americans believed that the refugees would soon improve their economic conditions and become self-sufficient. Their ultimate goal was to prevent a potential wave of internal migration to the cities. On the contrary, they believed in creating a dense network of small agricultural settlements throughout Greek Macedonia, as you can see in this map, which through their cooperative organization would become the main driving force behind the development of the Greek economy. The agricultural program of the Near East Relief, adopted by the Refugee Settlement Commission, had its complementary axis. The first axis concerned infrastructure, large land improvement projects in the plains of Axios and Srimonas, which were necessary for increasing available land and combating malaria, as well as expanding the railway network to facilitate trade transport. Another axis focused on the development of agricultural education through the establishment of agricultural stations and institutes in various areas in Greek Macedonia. A third axis aimed at upgrading healthcare and improving sanitary 
and living conditions which were almost unknown in the rural Macedonia region until then, and the intellectual upliftment of farmers through the operation of libraries, even in remote settlements, as well as the education of women in new occupations. The evaluation of the program was generally positive. By the late 1930s, Greek Macedonia was dotted with small agricultural settlements, more than 1,000, where farmers owned small but intensively cultivated plots of land. Most of them had already repaid the majority of the loans they had received. Politically, these small landowners were, for the most part, clients of the Venizelist parties. Furthermore, the major land improvement projects had largely been implemented with the diversion of the Strimonas River course completed by 1931 and the drying of uh, Lake Yamcha completed in 1936. The cultivated lands more than doubled. Agricultural education had also expanded and had even been incorporated into religious Sunday schools. New crops and techniques had been introduced and yielded results. The education of women had also been successful, mainly through the expansion of domestic education. Toilets and sewage systems had been installed in most settlements. There are some pictures from Greek Macedonia um, during the Hidrogo period. On a methodological level, the establishment of settlements along the border areas and the placement of mountain refugee populations there acted as a deterrent to Bulgarians and Serbs regarding the cultivation of any Irenetis visions at the expanse of Greek Macedonia. However, not everything was rosy, of course. As in the rest of Greeks, urban settlements struggled. The lack of industrial infrastructure in cities, particularly in Thessaloniki, inevitably created marginalized neighborhoods on the outskirts of major cities where refugees continued to live under appalling conditions for many decades. This situation forced unemployment, child labor, and many other pathogenic phenomena while gradually cultivated the conditions that led a significant portion of the refugee population to turn to the Greek Communist Party. It was truly a cosmogony. The tragedy for Greece was the rapid demographic changes of the first quarter of the 20th century and the profound political, economic, and social consequences interrupted in the early 1940s due to the outbreak of World War II and subsequently to the Greek Civil War. From the beginning of the Cold War, Greek Macedonia found itself once again in a state of emergency. Many of the people who had contributed to its reconstruction during the Eastern War period returned to assist in the colossal task. Of course, the situation was now very, very different. But that's another story worth discussing another time. Thank you so much. Uh, many thanks to Mr. Mikhailidis. So, the, my, the Asia Minor disaster and the, the uh, 1923, 100 years ago, was a period of shock for Greece. First of all, because it was a defeat. There was a defeat. But there was also a shock in urban planning, in housing, in production, in the in economy, in the political situation of Greece. And Mr. Sotiropoulos is here, I think, both positive and negative, Mr. Sotiropoulos, no? Well, yes, in a way. Um, because it's a crisis and it's also an opportunity. Always. Okay, so Mr. Sotiropoulos will, will give us his view on, on what happened to Greece after the Lausanne Treaty, how Greece changed, what was new in that new Greece. Okay, so thank you very much, I, and uh, especially 
thanks for the invitation to the organization to the organizers and it's a big honor for me to be here uh, so if we consider the phases of, on, of historical crisis in the course of a state as those periods in which strategic challenges prevail, then we, sh we could and should propose a different periodization of, for the evolution, especially of the Greek state, a la long durée. Uh, thus, in the first 100 years of its life, since the revolution of 1821, what dominates in a catalytic way in public life and which sets the major priorities for the political system is the national integration crisis. It is not just one of the many challenges the state has to face, but the one that decisively defines all the others. Therefore, the decade of the great idea climax which will end dramatically with the Treaty of Lausanne, will also be the, de the decade of the climax of two completely different stra strategies conflict. On the one hand, we will have the Venizelist faction with an ambitious but realistic plan that had the allies support and which was also accompanied by state modernization. And on the other hand, we have the small but honest, the small but honest Tin Mikrala Endimo, Greece of the pro royalists who echoed the culture of the 19 small landowners, landowners of old Greece, romantic with limited horizons, without a clear modernizing plan for, the, for a 20th century country. Despite the Asia Minor devastation and the enormous challenge of refugee resettlement that lay ahead, the strategy that would have prevailed in 1923 was one of Venzelist nationalism. The country had more than doubled occupying the largest, the largest and most important part of Macedonia, as well as most of the Aegean Islands. In uh, geopolitical importance, it's a geopolitical importance to the Allies was now unquestionable, while all these successes had been achieved by its own forces, something that, that had strengthened the feeling of national self-confidence as never before, transforming a small and completely dependent country on the Allies into a truly independent, trustworthy state. The problem with the national schism, however, was that it is not only determined the terms of the, poten of the political conflict at the end of the great idea, but also undermined the political foundations of the next historical phase of the Greek state. If the first 100 years of its life passed, as we said, in a prolonged crisis of national integration, after 1923 and for the next 15 years, what we see is an equally long crisis of democratic maturation. At the same time, this challenge of national integration regarding the new areas and the new population that had been added to the Greek territory has not finished yet. The thing was that the end of the great idea could no longer hide the failures of the Republic in the name of the state under siege according to the term then used, which allowed the executive power all kinds of manipulation. Uh, if it should be noted that when we speak here of democracy, we are not limited to the abolishment of monarchy, as the Venizelists warned, wanted after 1922, but to the consolidation of the rule of law and the respect of democratic procedures as defined by the, their respective constitutional mandates. First of all, the schism itself would lead to, a, to incredible institutional mishandling and would justify numerous democratic divergences on both sides. A summary list shows that within 15 years, there were so many democratic practices implemented that it was impossible for a solid democracy to be established. After all, the interwar period itself was founded on a blatant dis uh, distortion uh, of, of, of the truth. The imposition of a military dictatorship, like that of 1922, was baptized a revolution, while the trial and execution of the six, which put all the responsibility for the Asia Minor disaster on the anti venzelist part, was a key factor in perpetuating the schism. Then we have the failed counter-revolution of the anti venzelist in 1923, while it was 
which was accompanied by mass firings of pro-royal officers, and then again the coup d'etat by Pangalos in 1925 and by Condils in 1926. And in the elections of 1923, but also of these of 1928, we have the imposition of the narrow constituencies electoral system, this tenoebria, in order to clearly favor the Venizelist faction, while in 1924 we also have a legislat le le the legislative decree on the consolidation of the democratic state, which punished the, with imprisonment those who spoke sympathetically of the declining royal family. In 1929 comes the idionimo, which persecuted political ideas, but which mainly restricted trade union freedoms brutally. In 1933, there is a new failed coup d'etat attempt by Plastira, and then a new assassina assassination attempt on Venizelos, organized by the general security commander himself, appointed to office by the head of the anti Venizelist Panagi Chaldares. In 1935, we have a new coup d'etat attempt by Plastira by Plasteras with the approval of Venizelos, which after its fiasco is followed by executions and mass persecutions of Venizelist officers. This whole period ends with the restoration of the monarchy that will be sealed by a fake referendum, and of course the Metaxas dictatorship on August 4, 1936. It is worth noting here that many of these authoritarian regime's tools were used for the persecutions of its opponents were copied by the post-war regime in dealing with the communists. In fact, the same practice of deportations to small and faraway islands had been institutionalized ever, even earlier, in 1924. Here we have a remarkable, I think, continuity that shows the underground affinities of the pre-war and post-war world. Above all, this period has highlighted the major problem posed to democracy by the king's active position in political affairs and his direct interventions in them, clearly enjoying the position of a factional leader and not the one of, of an arbiter who stands above party competition. Thus, the institution of the monarchy, which until 1915 had never been questioned as such, emerged as a divisive institution and an institution that could hardly merge with democratization when it was not undermining it. And this ambiguity of its position will be perpetuated until 1967. In any case, the delay in institutional maturation worked as a vicious circle because pol political parties had an interest in perpetuating the problem. Thus, the two major parties and their several branches had turned into a multi-party factions that used the state when they came into government to raise resources for their voracious competing needs. This together with a culture of hyper-politicization and hostility that accompanied this deep political social schism reinforced a corresponding political culture for over five decades that treated the opponent as an enemy worth exterminating him, not only politically. However, the Venizelists in particular did have a modernizing program for the state after the great idea that their opponents never had. And this was demonstrated in practice, especially in the four years of 1928, uh, 1932, that found Venizelos back in the prime, prime ministership, probably his most successful term in office. The democratization crisis would also be exacerbated by the emergence of the army as a crucial factor in the political game. Even the so-called Second Hellenic Republic of 1924-1935 will owe its existence at the beginning uh, to the alliance of Alexander Papanastasi with stratocrats like Condilis and Pangalos. The army and the various Praetorians in the interwar period will develop into an executive arm of the two factions and a tool for coup interventions, not necessarily when all other means had, had been exhausted. The army will be partially autonomous in some, case, in some cases, but will remain largely, largely integrated into the existing Venizelist pro-royal schism. This will be its difference, I could say, with the army after the war, which as the winner of the Civil War and with the generous American aid and guidance, will maintain a greater degree of autonomy with a part of it even conspiring against the entire 
political system in the de decade of uh, 60s, leading to the imposition of the colonel's junta in 1967. As society evolves and morals modernize, the military will evolve in the opposite direction to custodians of, conservatives, of conservatism and tradition. Finally, there is the international environment, is, which is negative for democracy all this time. In conditions of the old empires, collapse, intensity of social rivalries, global economic crisis, especially after 1929, and structural difficulties for liberalism to provide convincing answers, those who are favored in this period are social experimentation and the tendency towards authoritarian or totalitarian solutions. Thus, the dilemma that will arise in the 30s as to which model of governance will be the most effective in the face of external or internal crisis will not be simple to answer and certainly should not be viewed from the perspective of today's hindsight when it's very well known what kind of disaster hit the wrong answer to it. Let's add here the geopolitical dimension, especially for Greece, which, as has been said, is a geopolitical nation. After all, the issue has already been raised in the schism of 1915-16, one of the causes of which was related to the international orientation of the country. The issue may have been resolved at the level of politics in favor of Britain, but at the level of society, the interventions of the Entente during the November Civil War, as well as movements such as the Epistrati created a deep tradition of an underdog anti-Western, anti-capitalist culture in the popular and petty bourgeois strata, the effects of which may, will, may, may still reach today. These are the first seeds of an anti-imperialist rhetoric and ideology, despite the fact that the country has never suffered colonialism. As far as the processes of democratization are concerned, however, such a culture also had an impact on the processes of democratization, since the West has, was supposed to be the preeminent career of this political tradition. The social question, moreover, is even more uh, complicated. The homo homogenization of space and population would have been a huge challenge even for the most advanced states of the time. Especially the difficulties of Greek geography are exacerbated by the political gap between old Greece and the new countries, Nes Hores. Especially after 1915-16, the Greek territories politically divided into the new countries and Kurt vote massively for Venizelists, while all Greece, with the exception of Athens, are pro-royalists. However, a serious problem can also be found in the ethnic and cultural diversity that emerged after 1930-23. The fact that the overwhelming majority of the refugee and minority populations were in the new countries, is Nes Hores, is linked to the geo this geographical uh, gap. The question of receiving and rehabilitating and integrating the refugees who make up almost one-fifth of the population as a result of the mandatory population exchange with Turkey is, of course, the first priority. But the settlement in the regions of Macedonia where Muslim, where Muslim populations once lived allowed the cultural homogenization of a large geographical area that had been the focus of a long-standing tension between the emerging Balkan nationalism during the Macedonia question. The important thing here was that the Venzelists were clearly in favor of the integration and assimilation of minorities using various, til various tools, but mainly education tools, and this strengthened the perception of a strong centralized national state that would not be threatened by tendencies of ethnic fragmentation or even succession. However, despite the Hellenization of Macedonia, the issues with the remaining minorities remain open, that is, with the smaller ethnic groups, Slavs, Chamides, Kuchovlachus, especially on the border. Main, uh, many of which resisted integration or were strongly inclined towards the neighboring motherland. At the same time, there was also the social tension arising from the general deterioration of living conditions for the poorest, especially in the cities, but also in the countryside. The economic crisis after 1931, in the Greek case, would reduce incomes and job opportunities and population movements to urban centers would, 
worsen housing conditions. We saw that before. Uh, the danger of political radicalization for these people was thus present, but was absorbed by their petit bourgeois mentality and their Christ-like family conserv conservatism. What is all this? After all, I think it's a crisis of transition to modernity that remains incomplete and quite contradictory in this period. What would finally strengthen decisively the joints of an homogenized national society would be a patriotic war like the one against the Mussolini's Italy in 1940. The patriotism that accompanied the social modernization, at the f mobilization at the front, worked to a great extent unifying, transcending the interwar divisions. The civil war that will have arisen in the 40s will lead to a new schism, of course, but with new terms unrelated to those of the interwar period. Some elements of the interwar policy, political legacy, however, will continue to weigh heavily in the post-war era, mainly the place of the king and the army in the political life of the country, which will be both the main obstacles to democratization until 1974. Likewise, one should think about the interwar legacy of hostility culture and inability to have a minimum consensus between political parties. To come to a conclusion, we must see in this pre-war period the beginning of a historical phase of the country that will last for, 15, uh, for 50 years, during which both national integration and democratic maturity are in doubt. We should underline at the same time on a cultural level, certain parts of society had already met and embraced modernism. An undeniable witness in the artistic creation is the artistic creation of the so-called Generation 30s, whose modernist legacy would remain alive in the 60s or even in the 80s. And this frequent asymmetry between the political system and society is something that should preoccupy more our research regarding the Greek case. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much.